Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Lashana Tava. Happy New Year. Let's give a round of applause for Lashana. Thank you were wondering why we have apples and honey here. This indeed is New Year's weekend. Rosh Hashanah, from sunset Friday to sunset tonight, with special prayers, food, family gatherings, our observant Jewish friends are marking Rosh Hashanah, literally translated the head of the year. Rosh Hashanah is the Jewish New Year, a celebration of God's creation of the world. It's the first day of the high holidays leading up to the most significant day of the Jewish religious calendar. Anybody know what day that is? Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Yes. From temple services with the blowing of a hollowed out ram's horn known as a shofar and calls to repent from sin, calls to return to God, symbolizing uh, by the tossing of breadcrumbs upon the waters, the tossing away of sins and taking upon charitable acts, warm family gatherings, and something that I'm looking forward to trying today, hopefully along with some of you after the service, and that is slices of apples dipped in honey to wish one another a sweet and blessed new year. So if you can stay for a few minutes after the service, uh, we'll enjoy apples and honey together. It's a sweet time of celebration and reflection. Now, we as Christians are not bound in a slavish sense to commemorate special days. We're not bound to holy days, festivals, new moons, or Sabbaths. In fact, we are not bound to gather and worship on Sunday even, though it is called the Lord's Day. One of our brothers was sharing with us the other day that while living in a Muslim country, the work week allowed for Friday as a day of worship and gathering. And so Christians in that society gathered for worship and reflection and fellowship on Fridays because the first day, Sunday, was a day of work for them in that culture. So we see we are not bound to certain days, but we are free to celebrate and free to commemorate, free to follow the example of Jesus in marking special days. In fact, Genesis 1 tells us that one of the reasons for the sun and moon and stars was to mark the seasons and the days so that we would know when these special days of observance come. Now, many people wonder what Jesus had to say about the Jewish holiday. What did Jesus have to say about the Sabbath day in particular? We know the Sabbath day being sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. What we see when we study the New Testament Gospels, along with the prophecies of the Old Testament and the words of Jesus himself, as well as the apostles, is that not only did Jesus fulfill holidays like Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, by his once for all final sacrifice upon the cross. We know also that Jesus commemorated the Jewish holidays, like the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles, also known as Sukkot. John chapter 7 tells us of that. <laughs> he even recognized a holiday that is not found in the Bible, but is still celebrated by many Jewish people today, the holiday called the Feast of Dedication, you might know it as Hanukkah. Jesus celebrated Hanukkah. Of course, Jesus celebrated Passover, we know that. He celebrated the Feast of Unleavened Bread, pointing to his sinless life and his saving sacrifice. Even, this is really quite amazing, and I think this is what the Apostle Paul referred to in 1 Corinthians 15, even Jesus' perfectly timed resurrection on the first day after the Passover Sabbath was clearly timed to fulfill the feast of first fruits, with Christ himself being the first fruits of the resurrection of the dead. Of course, it was what holiday when the Holy Spirit came, as Jesus promised? 
Pentecost, another Jewish holiday. And with regard to this weekend's Rosh Hashanah and the blowing of the shofar trumpets, what does Jesus say about Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year, the blowing of the trumpet? He says, King Jesus says, that his return will be accompanied by a loud trumpet call. Or as the apostle writes, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive can remain. While we do not know the day or the hour of Christ's return, there are some who think that the trumpet call points to Rosh Hashanah. Or perhaps we might see it as the head of a new year, a new celebration that Jesus will inaugurate in his return. So why all this talk about Jesus and the Jewish holy days? Today we're continuing our series, What Jesus Actually Said. We've been looking at topics throughout the Gospels that Jesus spoke much about, but sometimes we experience confusion. And as I shared at the beginning of our series, what I encounter when talking to people who are not Christians quite often is that they have a lot of uh, space for Jesus, but they don't really like Christianity oftentimes. They say, I like Jesus, but I don't like what I hear the Bible teaches. Or they'll say, I like what Jesus said about this subject, but that's not what you say as a Christian, is it? And it got me thinking, well, wait a minute. I don't think many people really understand what Jesus actually said. And that's true not only in the world, but sadly it's true in our churches. We ought to be reading the Gospels every day along with the rest of the scriptures that are breathed out by God. But I would encourage you to embark on a scripture reading or listening plan that includes a daily selection from the Gospels. Because we as Christians are followers of the teachings of Jesus. In fact, next time somebody asks me if I'm a Christian, I'm going to tell them, well, yes, I am a follower of the teachings of Jesus. Because that's really what a Christian is, one who not only learns but obeys the teachings of Jesus. So today we consider what Jesus actually said about the Sabbath. Say it with me. The Sabbath. The Sabbath. In the Gospels alone, the word Sabbath occurs some 50 times in 45 verses. So a very key idea to understand Jesus in the Gospels. We read of Jesus in the synagogue. He went there as was his custom. He taught the people. He cast out demons. He healed diseases and infirmities. All of these things, the scripture tells us, on the Sabbath day. So let's consider what Jesus actually said. If you got your bulletin, there's some blanks you can fill in on the back of the bulletin. You can follow along. It's a good way to stay away. Also, you can refer to it later on, uh, maybe for a little bit deeper study on your own and a closer look at some of the passages that we'll quickly go over today. In the Gospels, we read how the Sabbath day sadly became a major source of conflict and a sore spot in Jesus' relationship with the scribes and Pharisees. And you can even observe that the Sabbath day itself figures prominently in the Passion accounts recorded in all four Gospels. So the first thing we ought to recognize about the Sabbath, and this relates to the law of Moses in general, the Sabbath being one of the Ten Commandments to keep the Sabbath, remember the Sabbath, Jesus came not to abolish the law, but to what? Fulfill it. To fulfill it. Fulfill and we studied this uh, this past week when we were gathered together on Wednesday for our Wednesday Bible study in Matthew chapter 5. So I won't belabor the point, but in Matthew 5, Jesus clearly says, verse 17, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. It is a false teaching to say that the God of the New Testament is different than the God of the Old Testament. It is a false teaching to say that Jesus is a God of love and the Old Testament is a God of anger, that they're two separate gods. Two separate approaches. No, one God, unchanging in all his ways, 
eternally existing, one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So do not be led astray by those who say that Jesus came to set aside the law or to do something in contradiction to what was proclaimed in the Old Testament. Rather, he fulfills the Old Testament. It points forward to Jesus. It is fulfilled by Jesus. It foreshadows Jesus, and Jesus is the fullness uh, to which the Old Testament points. So we see in these verses that Jesus neither relaxed nor set aside even the smallest commandment. That's what he says in verse 18. Truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, an iota being the <laughs> smallest marking of the Greek alphabet, a dot being the smallest marking of the Hebrew alphabet, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the most religious, holy people you can think of, the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus proclaims he neither relaxes nor sets aside even the smallest commandment. Second of all, we see that Jesus did not set aside the Sabbath commandment. That's what that means. If he is here not to abolish, but to fulfill, not to set aside or relax, we see, therefore, Jesus did not set aside the Sabbath commandment. Just a few minutes ago, Jimmy Sue read for us from Exodus chapter 20 of the Sabbath commandment. And so I think it's important for us to hear how God puts it. Revelation, rather, Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. What does the word of God say? Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. So six days, work hard, get all your work done. The seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God, a day of rest. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, not your male servant, not your female servant, your livestock, the sojourner in your gates. And for, and here's the reasoning in Exodus 20, in how many days did God create the heavens and the earth? Six. Six days. And the sea and all that is in them. And what did God do on the seventh day? He rested. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, anybody know what the word Deuteronomy means? It's a Greek word. No. It means second law. Second law. Because it's like a repetition of the law before the people entered the promised land. So it's some 40 years later in Exodus 20, we come back to Deuteronomy 5, and it's repeated again. The law of the Lord. And when you look at Deuteronomy 5, verse 12, it says, Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Then we have the same instructions about uh, resting and allowing all of those in your household to rest on that day. Six days of work, one day of rest. But the reasoning of Deuteronomy 5 is different. It says, you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commands you to keep the Sabbath day. So we see the Sabbath day is a way of remembering that God built into creation this rhythm of work and rest. Six days of work, one day of rest. We need to honor God, our creator, on this Rosh Hashanah weekend when the creation of the world and the heavens is celebrated. We need to honor God, our creator, by remembering that rhythm of hard work, but also rest. Resting in the Lord. Resting in the Lord and his word and his promises trusting in him to provide for us so that we can rest. And then as Deuteronomy says, when we rest, we also need to allow others to rest. 
to respect the fact that others are seeking to honor and remember this rhythm of work and rest that is found in God's very good creation. One more thing about Jesus we see in terms of the Sabbath and fulfilling it, not abolishing it. Jesus kept the Sabbath as a custom. Jesus kept the Sabbath as was his custom. Look at Luke 4, verse 16. We ought not to pass too quickly over this reference. Luke 4 and verse 16. Now, we know this as when Jesus went to the synagogue in Nazareth, and he stood up and he read from the prophet Isaiah those beautiful words about the Messiah's ministry of freedom and liberation. And he said, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. A truly powerful moment that had clear implications as to who he was and caused people there to uh, get pretty upset at him in the end. But something we pass over is what it says in verse 16. I want you to look carefully at it. Luke 4, verse 16. Who's got your Bible open? Raise your right hand. All right, one, three, four, five people. Okay. Luke 4, verse 16. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And what does it say? As was his custom. He went to the synagogue and the Sabbath on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. On the Sabbath day, it was his custom to go to the synagogue and gather with God's people for worship and fellowship. I think this extends as an application, by the way, to us as Christians. Part of following Jesus' example is by setting aside a day of the week that we will gather together with God's people for worship for fellowship, and for learning. And since you're gathered here today, congratulations. Great job. Way to go. It's beautiful to benefit from the joy of gathering together on a day of the week as God's people. Uh, flip over to Mark chapter 1. Again, we have several verses we're looking at today, and I want you <laughs> to look at each one along with me. Mark chapter 1, verse 21 and following. This is a very busy Sabbath day. You say, wait a minute, I thought the Sabbath day was supposed to be a day of rest. <laughs> well, Jesus was often very busy on the Sabbath. Just like a minister might be very busy on the Lord's day, the first day. It says, they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority, and not like the scribes. Immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And the unclean spirit cried out. Imagine we're gathered here at Montrose and we are worshiping and all of a sudden somebody manifests an unclean evil spirit in our presence. Probably everything's going to come to a halt, right? You don't just kind of go, hey, uh, Usher, take care of that. I'm up. I want to finish the sermon. I mean, if, if that were to happen, you know, we all would start praying and come around that person and reading scripture and seeking to deal with that unclean spirit. So Jesus has to deal with it. The unclean spirit cries out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. The demonic spirit is not honoring Jesus as the demonic spirit cries out in this gathering, uh, but rather... In naming Jesus, there's a sense of seeking to claim authority over him. Of course, demons have no authority over Jesus. Jesus rebukes him, saying, be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulses the man, cries out with a loud voice, and comes out. And all the people in the synagogue on the Sabbath day were amazed. So they questioned among themselves, saying, what is this, a new teaching? With authority, he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. And it says immediately after this incident, Jesus leaves the synagogue, and he goes to what appears to be his home base of operations in Capernaum, which is the home of Simon and Andrew. He goes there with James and John. It says Simon's mother-in-law 
lay ill with a fever. And immediately they told Jesus about the high fever she had. She was laying ill. She couldn't get up. She had a high fever that had overcome her. So Jesus came, took her by the hand, lifted her up, and immediately, what do you think happened? The she fever left her, and she got up and began serving. By the way, another application for us as Christians. When Jesus forgives us of our sin, brings healing to our life, he doesn't do it so that we can just kind of have a hot tub Christianity where we just sit in the saintly suds and wait for heaven. He saves us so that we can be of service to him and his kingdom now. And so when he saves and delivers Simon's mother-in-law from this fever, immediately she begins to serve them. And it says, evening at sundown, the people brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. Now, word had spread about Jesus and what he had done in the synagogue. Why do you think the people waited until sundown to travel to where Jesus was and bring him all the sick and demon-possessed to be healed? Why do you think? Just shout out. Because of the Sabbath. Because of the Sabbath. <laughs> because of the Sabbath. So we see here the people respecting the Sabbath. Uh, Jesus uh, invites them, meets them at the door of the house. It literally says the whole city of Capernaum was gathered at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him, and Jesus had authority over them. Rising very early in the morning, the next day, while it was still dark, what day of the week was that? Monday. Uh, the, the, the Sunday, Sunday yes, yeah. the first day. Early in the morning, while it's still dark. This morning, as I was reviewing this passage for the very first time, it jumped out to me. Wait a minute. That's the exact same thing the Gospel of John says about Easter morning. While it was still dark, and the other time it was early in the morning when the women came to the tomb. I wonder if there's meant to be some kind of an allusion to that moment. Jesus departs and goes to a desolate place, and there he prays. And Simon and those who were with him search for him. Everyone's looking for you. Jesus said, no, my mission is to travel to the nearby villages, and there proclaim the good news also. What do we see in this story? We see that Jesus kept the Sabbath as a custom. We see that the people around him honored the Sabbath as well. On like five occasions in the Gospels, we read of Jesus teaching on the Sabbath, and this was his customary activity. I want to urge you, if you're a follower of Jesus, I think it's important, I believe it's important to follow his example of honoring not honoring in the sense of uplifting a day or another, but remembering the rhythm of work and rest. Work six days and rest one. Set aside a day of rest. I'm working on this myself. I have never been successful in this. I have to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. I am trying uh, to be successful in this. For me, it seems that the second day of the week, Monday, is the closest day I can come to this, to a day of focused renewal, refreshment, reading the scripture, studying the scripture, really focusing in on what God has for me. But when I say a day of rest and Sabbath, some of you feel that as a weight, don't you? Some of you that have grown up hearing the idea of Sabbath think of it as yet another burden to carry. I think of growing up as a child and being taught that Sunday was the Sabbath and that you weren't supposed to do certain things on Sunday. So Sunday afternoon, my parents were both busy teachers. My dad was a school principal. And Sunday afternoon, beautiful day, I want to go out and play catch with my dad, and we would do that kind of thing, but if we were at a certain relative's house, and they saw us playing catch with the baseball on a Sunday, they'd say, hey, no sports on Sunday. <laughs> yeah. Remember one time, it was a beautiful Sunday afternoon at a relative's lake house, and we decided to go out in the canoe and go fishing. 
And I don't know what happened, but a storm came up while we were out in the canoe. And somehow water got into this little boat, and it began to sink. <laughs> and our relative came out of the house, saw us about 20 yards offshore sinking, and said, that's what you get for fishing on Sunday. <laughs> pretty, pretty harsh. <laughs> And so I recognize that when we talk about the Sabbath, when I share with you that I believe the Sabbath is a principle we should recognize today, that some of you feel that as a burden, just like people in Jesus' day may have felt that as a burden. It's not to be something we slavishly follow, but something we joyfully embrace. That's what the Sabbath is meant to be. Let's look more at what Jesus has to say. You know, Jesus had a reputation for not keeping the Sabbath. You say, wait a minute, didn't you just say that Jesus did keep the Sabbath? Yes, he did. But he had a reputation for not keeping the Sabbath. For instance, he allowed his disciples to pluck grain on the Sabbath. And by the strict interpretation of the scribes and Pharisees, to be walking by a field and to pluck grain from the edges of the field, which was allowed and was not considered stealing, by the strict interpretation of the scribes and the Pharisees, what they did was wrong because they were, quote-unquote, harvesting on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees said to Jesus, why are you doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Luke chapter 6, verse 3. Jesus answered them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry? And those who were with him, how he entered the house of God, took and ate the bread of the presence, not lawful for any but the priest to eat? also gave it to those with him, and he said to them, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Another example we see of Jesus developing a reputation for not keeping the Sabbath. On multiple occasions, Jesus healed diseases and infirmities on the Sabbath. So we continue in Luke 6, verse 6. It says, on another Sabbath... Jesus entered the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was withered. So he was lame in his right hand. The scribes and Pharisees were watching Jesus to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might find a reason to accuse him. And it wasn't just an accusation like, we want to wag our fingers against you. This is the accusations of, let's say, in America, the Department of Justice, when they're looking for a reason to accuse someone or to indict someone, uh, they might be looking for a legal reason to bring them to court and perhaps even to seek um, a remedy by law or imprisonment or worse against the person. So they're looking for a reason to make a legal accusation against Jesus. But it says he knew their thoughts and he said to the man with the withered hand, hey, buddy, why don't you come on up here in front of everybody? And so the man comes up to the front of the synagogue. Everybody's watching. What's Jesus going to say? What's Jesus going to do next? And he rose and stood there, and Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? To save life or to destroy it? No one answered him. And so Jesus looks all around at the people there. One gospel says he looked at them in anger. And he said, stretch out your hand. The man did so, and his hand was restored immediately. They were filled with fury. Now, wait a minute, what? Imagine if a person came to our church and had a, a lame arm and they came up front in faith, and we prayed over them, and that arm was healed, that hand was healed. What would be the next response? Be joy, excitement, bewilderment, praise. I mean, Rick and Robin and Tanya and Debbie and Jimmy Sue and Baby and the whole worship team would come up front, and we start singing, How Great Is Our God, and it would be an awesome moment, right? And yet they respond with fury. By the way, if you see a work of God and respond with jealousy or anger or fury, that's a big warning sign, a big red flag. They were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus and what they decided to do to Jesus. 
They wanted to they wanted to kill him. They wanted to get rid of him. Boy, we, we could look at so many other stories of Jesus uh, healing diseases and infirmities on the Sabbath. You can thumb through the Gospels, for instance, to Luke 13 and verse 10. A woman who has a disabling spirit for 18 years, she's bent over, cannot fully straighten herself. Jesus says, woman, you are freed from your disability. And his adversaries are put to shame as they confront him, saying, imagine this. Hey, there's seven days in the week. You can come on some other day to be healed, but don't come on the Sabbath day. We don't do that kind of thing around here. That's not how we do things around here. Jesus says, you hypocrite. What if it's the Sabbath day and you have an ox or a donkey? Uh, that is, uh, you need to take and water, and feed it, and help it to get a drink. Won't you do so? And yet this daughter of Abraham, afflicted for 18 years, bound by Satan, you refuse to allow her to be healed. And all the people rejoice as the scribes and Pharisees are put to shame. Luke 14, another story of Jesus healing on the Sabbath and the Pharisees watching him closely. Jesus says, wait a minute. Which of you having a son or even a cow that has fallen into a well on the Sabbath day would not take the time to get them out? And yet you're telling me I can't heal on the Sabbath? Well, we can flip to John's gospel. John has some really cool stories. In fact, an entire chapter of John's gospel is Related to this, chapter 5 tells of uh, the healing at the pool uh, called Bethesda uh, on the Sabbath day and how Jesus confronts the religious leaders. You know what? A man had been lying there, unable to walk. Jesus heals the man. And you know what the man did? Imagine this. The man took up his bed and was walking and carrying it. That was against the Sabbath regulations of Jesus' day. Rather than rejoicing that this man had been healed miraculously by Jesus, a sign of the Messiah's coming, rather than rejoicing, the religious leaders were mad that the man was carrying his bed on a Sabbath day. And then John chapter 9, probably the craziest story of them all in terms of how religious people can get so off base with their rules and their slavish regulations. A man born blind is healed by Jesus on the Sabbath day. And there's a little wonder amongst the leaders as to how a man born blind could be healed. But what they're primarily concerned about is what? That Jesus healed him. That Jesus healed him and that he did so on the Sabbath day. And they said, you know what? There's no way, no way that this man can be of God for doing these things on the Sabbath. And the man said, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I do know is that though I was blind, now I see. And that, of course, is figurative not only for physical healing, but for the spiritual healing that each one of us has experienced in Christ. Jesus also spoke out against the Pharisees who slavishly observed the Sabbath. Matthew chapter 23, if you want to hear Jesus and how he can express righteous indignation and anger, Matthew 23 is the place. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 23 to the scribes and Pharisees. He says, do not do the works they do. Do not observe what they tell you, for they preach but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. Jesus says of them, they are hypocrites. They shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, and he says, you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. So Jesus speaks out clearly and harshly and unequivocally against those who slavishly observe the Sabbath and tie it up as a burden for people to be bear, to bear. As we move on rather quickly now with our final points, Jesus clarified the purpose of the Sabbath. 
We've already been over this, but what was the purpose of the Sabbath? Was man made for the Sabbath, or was the Sabbath made for man? The Sabbath was made for man. Jesus says it's to be a beneficial day for humanity. The Sabbath is not a burden that you and I must bear or feel guilt about or shame about. It's a joy that we can embrace. It's an opportunity to trust in God. Like that song we sang earlier, to say, Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. It's one thing to get the warm fuzzies as we sing that together on Sundays. But it's another thing to trust God so much that we express our need for him, our humility before him, by setting aside a day of the week for rest and reflection in his presence, rest from our labors, resting in God. Jesus also says it's a day of life-giving, a day for doing good, not for taking life, but for saving life, not for doing evil, but for doing good. That's what the Sabbath is to be, a life-giving day for doing good. So that means, let's say you say, all right, Pastor Jason, I'll take you off on this challenge. <laughs> for me, the best day to rest is Sunday. I'm going to set that day aside as a day of rest. I'm going to come to church and fellowship and worship with God's people. Maybe I'll even go the extra mile and come to the morning service and the evening service, right? And you say, that's going to be a day of rest and reflection. Uh, and then 1 o'clock Sunday afternoon, a friend of yours calls and says, oh, my goodness, my refrigerator is out. All of my meat is spoiling in the freezer. And my mouth is going to go bad in the refrigerator. Can you please come over here and help me out? No, sorry. It's the Sabbath. You can't do that. Not getting in my car. Not going anywhere. Not going to do any service today. It's a day of rest. Is that what Jesus was saying? No. Of course not. No. Of course not. You see a need, we meet a need. Jesus makes that very, very clear. So it's a beneficial day. It's a life-giving day for doing Good. Ceasing from labors that benefit us, but perhaps engaging in labors of service that benefit others as needed. We see also, as we saw earlier, that Jesus claimed lordship over the Sabbath. He said the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. Lordship over the Sabbath. By the way, what does it mean that Jesus is Lord? Can I put it in really clear terms? To say that Jesus is Lord means that Jesus rules. Jesus rules. When I was a kid, you know, if you thought you were cool, you'd be like, we rule, man, yeah. <laughs> That's not what we mean, because no. Jesus really is the ruler. He is king of kings. He is the one true God in the flesh. He is Lord over all creation. And if he's Lord over all creation, if he's Lord over all humanity, then Jesus is Lord even of the Sabbath. So Jesus rules in favor of Sabbath rest. Jesus does not set aside the principle of the Sabbath. I believe he rules in favor of Sabbath rest. And also Jesus rules out slavish observance of Sabbath regulations. Jesus rules out a sense of, oh my goodness, it's the Sabbath again. <sighs> <laughs> burning the bear, can't play catch with my dad, can't go fishing in the canoe. <sighs> no, that's not what, what Jesus yeah, says about the Sabbath. <laughs> Jesus rules in favor of rest, but he rules out slavish observance of Sabbath regulations. And finally, and this is a cool concept, we leave the Gospels and go to the book of Hebrews when we learn that Jesus himself is the key to entering God's Sabbath rest. So one other important thing about the Sabbath is that it points forward to a future reality. The Sabbath rest points forward to eternity. It points forward to a day when we will fully enter into God's blessed rest. It won't be boring. It won't be without creativity or adventure. But eternity with God in the new heavens and new earth will be rest. No more battle with sin. No more crying. No more death. 
No more pain. No more suffering. I'll go out for a jog, and I won't get weary, though I circled the world 25 times. Mount up with wings as eagles. Walk, run, not grow weary or tired. Jesus himself is the key to entering God's Sabbath rest. Even now, we can experience the rest that Jesus offers unto us. For as he says in Matthew chapter 11, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. You want to enter into God's Sabbath rest as Hebrews 4 describes a right relationship with God? Sabbath rest is something that we have to look forward to. We experience it now in part in Jesus, but we look forward to its fullness, which is soon to arrive. And what is the key? The key to Sabbath rest is that in Jesus we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, the Son of God. And so we hold fast to our confession in him. All of those Jewish holidays that we talked about earlier, they point forward to Jesus. Jesus doesn't set them aside or say it's wrong to observe them. In fact, it would be beneficial for us to observe the Jewish holidays, though not slavishly so. Jesus says, these things point forward to me. I don't abolish them. I fulfill them. The Sabbath rest that we look forward to is because we hold fast our confession in Jesus. Because we now have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with us in our weakness. But one who in every respect has been tempted and tested and tried in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. And so scripture says, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When we do so, when we draw near to Jesus, it's then that we experience his blessed rest and get a little taste of the Sabbath rest that soon and very soon they belong to us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Gracious Father in heaven, thank you so much for Jesus' teaching about the Sabbath. God, I pray that as we've considered many passages today, that we have a little bit better understanding of what Jesus said and taught and how he lived and the example that he set. I pray, God, that you give us the courage and the humility to paradoxically, so as Hebrews says, strive to enter that rest. For some of us, it's going to take some work of planning and strategy and some humility to say, I want to honor God by giving a day of rest, and renewal and refreshment, recognizing that one day of rest could supercharge six days of work, that we might be more effective for Christ and his kingdom. And that we might receive that joyful taste of heaven, even here on this present earth. God, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you that he